الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم السيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله you've already heard the actual essence and the most fruitful sessions in which you can actually attain the most benefit and from the month of Ramadan the spiritual aspect and for you to actually understand what we're actually going to be undertaking now is the outer dimension is that in deen, in Islam, there is, there is always an outer form and there is always an inner form. I.e., you always have a shell and you always have the kernel. So, with regards to fasting, imagine if I was to say, if we take, like I was telling our students yesterday, if you take the example of a banana, you have the skin of the banana and you have the actual banana itself. Now, if I was to ask yourself, is where do the most benefit lies? Is it the skin or is the actual banana itself? So if we just eat away the skin, what will you say to that person? What will that person say if you see a person just eating the skin of the banana? And all the students are saying, they think this is very foolish, it's very fool. You think he's gone mad, he's gone insane. Similarly is that what we're doing as a collective unit, most of us is we always focus on the outer and we're never indulging in the inner and learning about the inner and manifesting the inner and incorporating the inner. So for example, the fasting you just, which we will go through, which you can get from any books, you can read it, the outer dimension, the thick, the do's and don'ts. But the kernel which you had just heard in the previous sentence, which our beloved Shah Mudabad that delivered is that is the actual fruit, is the actual benefit of, the, of Ramadan, of the fast. That's what you've heard. Which, if, if, if some of these brothers and sisters who've not been here for the first time, you might have never heard of any of the lectures like this before. So may Allah SWT bless us all and enable us to act upon what was just said previously and really, really internalize and manifest what was actually said in the previous lectures. So we move on, inshallah, because we haven't got much time. We've only got 45 minutes or so to go through these. And most of these, all of this is in your pamphlet or booklet that you've been given. So the definition of fasting. Linguistically, the word fasting in Arabic means to stop or to restrain from any action or speech during that time. So that's basically what you've heard before, is to restrain oneself. Linguistically, that's the wording of the word so means. Now, shar'an, shari'ah, in islahan is what we say is that according to the sacred law, fasting, the act of fasting, is to refrain from engaging in sexual activity and refraining from entering anything into the body cavity whether deliberate or accidental, from the time the sun begins to rise to the time the sun sets, accompanied with intention of fasting from individuals who are permitted to fast. So this is like a full work definition of how, what we say what fasting means in terms of shari ruling. Now, what do we mean by engaging in sexual activity is clear is that if a person uh, engages in sexual activity with man and wife then other, uh, an ejaculation takes place, this is caused by foreplay, this, is, this will actually, uh, this is what we refrain from in sexual activity, this is what we mean by that. Refrain from anything into the body's cavity refers to the acts of entering of food or drink or medicine into the body's cavity regardless of whether it is a typical item one would enter the body's cavity or not. And entering of any of these substances inside the body's cavities means that the substance enters into the throat, the intensity in the stomach, or the brain. And remember this. It's very important that you remember, and it'll safeguard you from when, whether you have to give kafara or not kafara, whether it breaks your fast, not breaks your fast. If you actually remember this, is that it's entering of the throat, the intestine, the stomach, or the brain by the way that the nose, the throat, or the private parts, or open wounds. 
and we'll discuss this what we mean by this a little bit later. And entering whether it's deliberate or accidentally excludes forgetfulness. So if you forgetfully eat or drink or have sexual activity, it doesn't break your fast. But accidental breaks, what do they mean by that? Is that you must which whichever accident fast you do, accidental breaks with those things that you knew that you're fasting. You knew that you're fasting and something entered or you did something that actually breaks a fast. So an accidental is when somebody is fully conscious of fasting at the precise time. For example, a person is aware, fully aware that he's fasting at that time, an accident is swallows water. Well making wudu or doing ghusl. Or nevertheless it is recommended the person repeats that fast and carries on with the fast as normal, if this does happen. From the time the sun sunrise, from the time the Subha Sadiq is to the sun setting, this is what we, we mean by the time the sun begins to rise to the time it sets. And then accompanied by intention is that it's a farad, it's, you have to make intention for your fast, otherwise it is null and void. From individuals who are permitted to fast, this means that one must be free from situation that will prevent the validity of one's fast. And we'll discuss that in a bit as well, such as menstruation or postnatal bleeding, etc. So, when does it become obligatory on a person, fasting? It's, it becomes obligatory, it becomes further than an individual, male or female, who is sane, who is bali, who has reached maturity, so fasting in the month of Ramadan is obligatory upon those who are able to fast, free from menstruation and postnatal bleeding, and are a resident, a muqeem of the area. So it's not that you, if you're a traveler, there's a different rule for this. We'll discuss that in a bit as well. Who's excused from fasting in the month of Ramadan? So here we mentioned that who is, is, is obligatory upon. So if you're at that stage, if you meet that creature, alhamdulillah, it's being forced upon you. If you're not, then you can keep uh, if, if, for example, there are children who also want to actually be nurtured and trained and to keep them fast, you can slowly train them up uh, how to actually keep them fast. When it's especially in these days, you can make them do a few hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, even a whole day if it can be. We can get them, but this is how Tarbi would be of a child, but we'll discuss that another time. Who is excused from fasting in the month of Ramadan? It is not obligatory upon the women, uh, with the women who are menstruating or in the fast because they're not allowed to fast in that state. An illness of such can actually cause a fast to be, uh, to be excused from that person. Um, now there we'll go to talking about if that illness is so severe, it's like a matter of life and death situation. Or if that illness that you know is very, very harmful from past experience, or if that illness which has been actually said, yes, this illness is very, very detrimental to your health by a doctor or an expert in that field. He said, this, you have to actually, a Muslim doctor in that field, he says, you should not fast whatsoever. It'll be detrimental to your life and your health. It's gonna really, really slow your recovery, etc., etc. Then you shouldn't fast. You've been excused. So you need to have a other there to actually tell you that you're excused. And these are some of them. If a person is a sister who's pregnant, if they know that it's going to be detrimental to the child, to the baby in the womb, then they, if they're advised by the doctor, who is a Muslim doctor there, that this is going to be very, very harmful for the child, please do not fast, then they, they can be excused. Or if there's a baby breastfeeding, a woman who is breastfeeding, and it's going to be really, really detrimental for the child, and it's not drinking anything else, and it's going to be very, very troublesome, again, we encourage that they do keep the fast, but again, from the approval of the doctors, if they say, no, it's, very going to be, it's going to be very harmful, then they can be excused. So it can't be something that you think, oh, I've got a pin here, oh, I think I'm really, really pain, and that's it, I don't want to fast today. Or oh, I've got a headache, I don't want to fast today. It's not from yourself, it's got to be from, from the expert uh, who can actually say this is actually correct or not. And also who are excused are those people who are traveling, they're excused from fasting, if they become a traveler, who's a traveler? A traveler is that person who travels 48 miles or more, if he stays or she stays for less than 15 days beyond the traveling distance, one would be legally considered a traveler. That's the legal definition of a traveler. So if you were to go, let's say, from here for, to, let's say, Europe or to Bangladesh or Pakistan, then you would be ex excused from fasting. So what does a woman do if she starts her menstruation? So this is quite important, uh, as well as for both males and females. 
The reason being is that I'm, from experience is that sometimes the male are not aware. So what happened is that, honestly, as a, as a, as a youngster, is that I didn't realize these sort of things. So obviously we were bereft of these ideas. So when I used to see my sisters not fasting, I used to shout. So because I didn't know, I didn't know about these things. So in a sense, whatever it may be, but we don't, if you don't, this is what happens. You learned about the purpose, you don't know what breaks, what doesn't break. This is why it's important, you know the do's and don'ts. So what could happen is that a brother or a sister, uh, could actually be shouting and screaming, why they're not fasting, why they're not doing this. And all you get told is they're ill. And you think, what sort of illness is this? <laughs> you know, not, I can't see them being ill. So we used to think, what kind of illness is it? Take some paracetamol, we'll find, you know, later on, don't be doing this, okay? So if you know this, for you as a husband who's going to become a husband, or you're going to be a brother and you've got sisters, you know then at least what's going on. You should be aware of yourself as to what is happening in the system, the internal system that goes on with the woman. You need to be aware of that as well, so that you can be considerate and complying to their needs as well and demands as well. And it is, it is vitally important that you do do that. Honestly, it will make, uh, uh, make your life a lot easier and it make it a lot more enjoyable. The marriage and your relationship will be a lot better if both sides understand each other's body needs and requirements. So if her menstruation starts in Ramadan during the night, so if the Ramadan, her menstruation, her period starts during the night, any time from the entering of Maghrib up until Fajr, then she should refrain from fasting the following day. She's excused. She's not allowed to fast. So if it starts at night time, she's not allowed to fast. She's excused from actually keeping the fast through until she, she actually becomes parked from that. Then if the menstruation starts during the day, any time during the day, even if it's one minute before Maghrib, before the entering of Maghrib, if her, if her menstruation, the bleeding starts during the day, immediately she should stop fasting. She should hand, what she'll have to do, she'll have to make up for that fast after the month of Ramadan. That one day, that, that if it was like half a day she did or whatever, that day's fast will not be considered. So it's very important that you were, and sisters also be aware of that, is that I'm sure you are. But we're just here to recap these rulings, which you're all probably aware of, but just to do recap because reminding benefits the believers. So she should make up the fast after the month of Ramadan has ended in the time when she's able to do so. She must refrain from fasting from the duration her menstruation starts. When a menstruating woman, when the menstruating women or woman can eat and drink during the day in Ramadan, Refraining from food or drink where, with the intention of fasting is unlawful for her. So she can't say, okay, I'm not going to eat and drink, I'm menstruating, I'm not going to eat and drink, but I'll hopefully get the, I'm going to make the intention of fast. You're not allowed to do that. Nevertheless, it's desirable that they follow of refrain from eating and drinking so that others don't see what's happening. It's always better to actually refrain from it. Or they shouldn't, nobody should see them eating and drinking because in case it affects those people, family members, who are actually fasting. So a menstruating woman should record the number of days missed while fasting and then make them up, make them up after the time of Ramadan has elapsed. So you should have a record. It's very important because sometimes what happens with sisters is that they become busy with the, house, with the housework, household chores, or maybe they become busy with studies and so forth, and time elapses, and they don't realize, wait a minute, how many days do I have to make up? Is it five days, is it seven days, is it three, four, I'm not sure. Be precise, be accurate, note down when it started and how many days you have to make up so that it doesn't pile up and you don't forget and you don't think, oh, should I make this many, that many? Sometimes sisters, if sisters have actually not done this before, or not known about this, you need to now calculate from the past how many days since your bulugha, how many days you're supposed to have actually made of, make of those fast. You need to calculate if you've not done so already. And then hopefully start executing the nawafil after the month of Ramadan to compensate that. So the same ruling applies for a, uh, for a sister or a mother who's actually in postnatal bleeding. She's, the same ruling applies as a person who's actually menstruating. The types of fast that are, as in the book there are about nine, this is, can be summarized to about seven types of fast uh, that a person can keep. 
one is specified as for the mu'ayyan, then for the ghair mu'ayyan, then there's wajib mu'ayyan, wajib ghair mu'ayyan, sunan, mustahab, and makruh. So for the mu'ayyan is when, obviously this is the specified for fasting that a person has to do. And this is the fasting for the whole month of Ramadan once a year. For the ghair mu'ayyan is a duty to keep upon the one keep a, a kaza fast missed in the month of Ramadan without a, with or without a valid excuse. So farad is the actual farad fast of Ramadan. Ghair mu'ayyan is non-specified is if you're making up a kaza of a farad. Kaza of the month of Ramadan fast. That will be ghair mu'ayyan. Then wajib mu'ayyan is when you make a vow, when you make a promise. Or we make another to specify a day for or a date for the sake of Allah SWT upon the fulfillment of a wish or a desire. Say for example, people say, if uh, I will keep a fast on Thursday if such and such happens. That's a vow now, that's another that you made, now you have to keep it. Okay. Ghair mu'ayyan, what you ghair is a vow or a pledge to keep a fast without fixing any day or time upon the fulfillment of a wish. Another. Those fasts which are kept for breaking one's qasam also fall under this category. So if you made a qasam, if you made a promise to Allah SWT that I will do such and such and you've not done it, it would also fall under that category as well, of the qadha of ghair mu'ayyan. Sunnat, those fasts which the Rasulullah kept and encouraged others to keep, for example, the fasting the 9th, the 10th of Muharram, 9th of Zulhijjah, etc., etc. These were emphasized by Prophet you should keep them, the results of virtues, try and do them. Mustahab fast, all others besides the farad, the wajib, the sunnah, are mustahab. For example, fasting on Mondays, fasting on Thursdays, etc. Those are the mustahab fast. And there's makru fast, and the makru fast are fasting only on the 9th or the 10th of Muharram, or fasting only a specific day, like Saturdays only, and that's it, without a reason. So making Saturdays that I'm going to just fast on Saturdays. Without a reason, this will be karaha. So there are more in the book which is specified, but this is what we summarize to. So what are the conditions for a valid fast? So the conditions for a valid fast is obviously you have to have intention. You make the niyyah. And this can be done verbally or by the heart. And it's better to say verbally. It's so not to actually say verbally. And the wordings is to the nearest effect, Oh Allah, I intend to keep fard fast for, the, for today in this blessed month of Ramadan. This will suffice. Now, a, co a note of caution, and I'm pr you'll probably be aware uh, of this, is that it's just a matter of wording and it's a matter of translation, that's all. Most of the books and most of the calendars, the Ramadan calendar that you're getting, is actually got the word ghad written on it. Ghadan, not assume ghadan, etc. The word ghadan in Arabic means tomorrow. The word ghad, ghadan means tomorrow. Now, this is only, we only learned this from our beloved teacher, Shahmad Abal. They, the ones who actually clarified this to us, is that this word in ghad means tomorrow. So when you actually keep in the fast, you're not keeping it for tomorrow. The, in Islam, the night comes first. The night of that day comes first, then the day proceeds. So when you're at night and when you have your suhoor, you're not keeping it for tomorrow, you're keeping it for today. So it should be instead of ghad, it should be al-yawm. Okay, today, this day. So this is just a little bit of wording for those who are studying Arabic, is that you need to be aware that the word ghad means tomorrow, it really should be for today, it's not for tomorrow. Because you're in this day, the night has actually come, and then the day is gonna proceed afterwards. Not tomorrow, which is the following day. To be free from menstruation or to be free from postnatal bleeding and to be free from anything else that will break the fast. I, if you don't refrain from eating, drinking, then that will break the fast. So these conditions all apply. However, for the validity of a fast, it doesn't mean that you have to be free from janaba. For women, menstruation, head, for, for men, janaba, it doesn't mean you have to be free from that. You can still keep a fast. Remember that. When does one make the intention, the niyyah? The niyyah is a farad in, in shari'a. In shari if one needs, if a person stays away from all those things that breaks one's fast without niyyah, the fast will not be valid. So you need to make that niyyah. So however, hook or crook, you make that niyyah intention. Even if you go to sleep and you know, just make the intention before you go to sleep, Allah, 
I intend to give us for tomorrow, for your pleasure. And then at least you've made the niyyah. Okay, then we'll also we'll go into detail up to what point you're going to, you can keep that near. It is necessary to express the near verbally as near means, means to intend. Thus, the intention of the heart will suffice. However, it is better to do it verbally. The time of the near lasts up to midday. For, remember the type of fast that I said? Is that for the for the mu'ayyan, wajib mu'ayyan, sunnan, and mustahab fast, for all of these, it's, it's necessary for you to actually make the fast before the midday. The Islamic midday, not the midday that we think of in the afternoon, the Islamic midday. And we'll show you how to actually quickly figure that out. The, so from the hour, what will be the day? The day lasts from Subha Sadiq all the way to sunset. And what we're going to do is the midpoint will be, you calculate the duration, and the midpoint will be the halfway in between, and then you calculate when, when is the halfway point. And that will be the Islamic midday. So the niya for for the غير معين, wajib غير معين, these are the kazaat that you're making up. These should be made before Subha Sadiq, before Fajr. You have to make that, otherwise it won't count. So you make the niyyah for all of this, for غير معين, for, for the غير معين, and also wajib غير معين, you need to make that niyyah a Subha Sadiq. Before all others for Ramadan, unless you overslept, oh no, what do I do? I, I've overslept. Can I still make, can I still keep the fast? Yes, you can, provided it's before midday. Islamic day. So here, how do we do it? For example, let's say Fajr starts at 4.30. Fajr starts at 4.30, and hypothetically, Maghrib is at 8.30. So that's about 16 hours or so, Takriban. So halfway point of 16 hours would be eight hours. Now what you do from 4.30, add eight hours to it. So 4.30 all the way, if you add eight hours, you come to about 12.30 p.m. in the afternoon. That is the midday point. So, for example, if a person was to keep fast that day, if he's not doing one of the ones which he has to make up, but let's say, he, let's say it's month of Ramadan and he's woke up at 11 o'clock, he looks at the time, it's not 12.30 yet. He or she still can make the intention and the fast will be valid. Is that clear? So that's how you calculate the any time. I've made nice, easy figure numbers here, so I don't want to like 4.33 and 8.31 is with difficult, so I made it nice and easy for you to actually understand and how to calculate it. So what are the mustahab acts of fasting? Uh, to eat something for sahri, this is actually mustahab. If this is the suhoor that you have. So even if it's a date, even if it's water, even have something, there is barakah, there's a blessing there. Don't deprive yourself of that blessing. And honestly, it's like, you, it's, a, it's not just the eating, it's that time that you're in just to wake up. It's such a blessed time, don't deprive yourself of that. So I know a lot of us, we've got work and you'll say, oh, I can't do it. Eat, but before you go to sleep, just have something and say, make the intention, this is my, this is my suhoor. And have something, at least you gain the blessing of that sunnah, and you gain the blessing of the barakah of having suhoor. To delay the sahri up until Subha Sadiq, it's a little before Subha Sadiq. A lot of the times what you see is that they say Sahri ends and Fajr starts. So Sahri ends, uh, let's say it says, uh, let's say uh, three, 10 past 3. And Fajr starts at 3.30. So is there's about 20 minutes gap between Sahri ends and Fajr starts. And you think, why is there 20 minutes gap? Okay, why is there 20 minutes? Or 10 minutes, why is there 15? The, the reason why the ulama is what they've done is that there is that they try to give you a little bit of leniency because some of us are clever and what we'll do is that we'll try to wait to the last minute where Fajr enters. Now, what it is that we're going by time and we're going by the, the concept of time. Maybe the Fajr enters about 30 seconds before he says on our clock. Maybe our clock is wrong. Maybe our watches are wrong. So for that precaution, they added that 10 minutes before the Fajr starts so that you don't, you're going into, basically, this is the danger period now. You're going into a danger period, we'll give that 10 minutes as safe grounds, so that you should really stop, this is a precaution, stop 10 minutes before the Fajr starts. If you keep on eating and you're waiting for the last seconds, there's a danger Fajr's already started. So don't risk it. So that's the ulama, Sharia is all about precautions, that ulama, they put that 10 minutes there just as a precaution. So please be aware of that. Try to stick to that precaution that they're giving you, but reality is that it's really at the Fajr time start, that's when you're supposed to completely build, no eating or drinking whatsoever from that point onwards. Uh, <clears throat> to break the fast immediately after sunset, so basically is that you get ready for iftari, you should, as soon as the as time sets in, you break the fast. You shouldn't actually wait and delay. 
So some of us, we're still waiting for the pakora. Is wait, wait, we're just gonna go over. You get the ketchup. You know, when, what is happening? We're all running around. Whatever it is, try and actually prepare yourself in advance. Have a nice nizam in the family. Somebody does one thing. Be prepared, well prepared. Make your du'as so you open your fast there and then. So you can do that. And to make the knee at night time. Okay, mukrahat, the mukrahat, the dislike acts of fasting. To chew gum, rubber, plastic, and so forth. To taste any article, food, or drink, and spit it out. If a woman has ill-tempered husband, inshallah, I'm sure none of us are here like that. Um, it is permissible for her to taste the food provided it doesn't go down the throat. So she's, a lot of times, have I put the salt in? Oh no, did I put the spice? Did I put the chili? Oh no, I, what do I do now? So don't panic, you're allowed to taste it. As long as you don't go out the throat, you'll be fine. To collect one saliva in the mouth and then swallow it, trying to quench the thirst. Now this is something that we probably did when we we're youngsters, especially if we're gonna do PE in school. Because if you have to run, okay, just try and get as much saliva as possible, and then yes, okay, we can last another few more rounds of football or whatever it is. So to de delay a bath that has become fudd knowingly until Subh Sadiq, this is also karaha, you should try and do it before or before. To use paste or tooth powder to clean one's teeth, for example, you forgot you woke up, you have to go to work and you open your mouth and go, oh my gosh, what's happened here? And you think, what are my colleagues going to think today, what's going to happen? So you're worried what's going to happen. But this, for us, for me and you, is abhorrent. But in the sight of Allah Santala, it's beloved. Allah Santala loves the, the smell that comes out of a fasting person, fasting individual. That smell is sweeter than most in the sight of Allah Santala. That's how beloved it is. Because that person is sacrificing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one can use a miswak, that's perfectly fine. You should, have, uh, you should try and actually um, uh, brush your teeth and everything before one sleeps or one rests, uh, just before Subah Sadiq. To delay the bath that has become further known until Subah Sadiq. To use paste, we've mentioned that it's permissible to clean the, uh, clean the teeth with miswak, this is fine. Even a dry toothbrush, if you have a, tooth, a toothbrush, just to rub, it's the same concept as, as miswak, but you're not going to get the reward of sunnah. But if you just use a toothbrush without any toothpaste, it's permissible. This is fine. It's not karaha, it's not disliked. To take water up to the, as much as the nostrils when cleaning the nose. So basically is that if you are fasting, if you're fasting, then when you're doing wudu, you take the water up to the nose, isn't it? When you do udu, you also, you, when you do ghusl, you take it to the nose as well as gargle as well. In fast, when you're fasting, refrain from that. Is that don't sniff up and don't take it too far up and don't gargle because the danger, if the water does go up the nose, it goes down to the back of the throat or goes down to the throat when you're gargling, your fast will be broken. So be careful is when you are if you need to do ghusl, if you need to do wudu, is when you're doing wudu especially, refrain from gargling, refrain from sniffing the water up, and be careful taking it too far up the nose that it goes down. If it does, it'll break the fast. So to quarrel and to argue, this is also mukruhat, you're fasting, refrain from these acts, abnormal acts of sinful acts like backbiting, etc. Are there things that can break the fast? Yes, there are things. Now, what we've done is that we're going to put it into two categories. In your book, they put in two categories. One, which will break the fast, and what will happen is that you need to make it up, as well as give a kafara, which is an expiation, a penalty. Okay? One is that you, if you do this act, you'll break the fast, and you have to give kafara, expiation. And the other is, you do this act, you'll break the fast, but there's no kafara. You don't need to give exhortation. You just make that fast up after the month of Ramadan. So what are they? That's what we'll go through now. The first category, when you have to do kada of that fast, make up that fast, as well as give kafara, which is expiation, is that the ruling, the principle is that deliberately performing an act that breaks the fast by one's own free will and without a valid reason. Deliberate means that one remembers that one is fasting and purposely performs an act that breaks the fast. Purposely. So there, what you'd have to do is you, not only do you have to make up that one fast, but also give kafara for it. And we'll explain why is a kafara, what's the expiation. The second category is you just have to make the fast only. The principal ruling of that is that accidentally perform an act that breaks a fast. It includes acts performed by force of third parties. So somebody puts something in your mouth, etc., etc. 
that might, um, that uh, goes down your throat, unfortunately. Now, we don't want those brothers. I know you brothers get very hungry, and I know some of them are there, and I know you like your burgers, and I know you like your kebabs, so make sure you don't get your friends to actually make sure, telling you, here you go, try this, and then deliberately doing that as a joke even. You shouldn't do that. Accidentally means that one remembers that one is fasting, but broke the fast by one's own doing without intention to purposely break the fast. So this category is, you just made the kada up after the month of Ramadan. So the thing, the fast that breaks will require you to keep the fast, make up the fast, but does not require expiation. What are they? Anything that is put in the mouth by force of a fasting person and it goes down. Water used to clean the nose for wudu or ghusl reaches the throat or the brain conscious of one's fasting. To vomit mouthfully intentionally or to return the vomit down the throat. So you remember it's mouthful. To vomit mouthful intentionally. So a lot of people, you might be thinking, why would you want to do that? Sometimes they do do that. It's a habit of them. That's why sisters, brothers become anemic, anemia, all these uh, things happen because they deliberately are conscious of the weight. So they think, if I vomit the food out, I won't gain weight. That's good. So they deliberately know how to actually do that. So to do this, if you vomit mouthful, it'll break your fast. But if you vomited, let's say you vomited, it was a mouthful, and you weren't, it's just vomit just to come out. Then to, if it's just come out, then what happens, it's in your mouth. If you swallow that back, it can happen. Sometimes because of the force, you just could not actually stop yourself from actually swallowing back, it just goes back, and you swallow it in, this will break the fast. It'll break the fast, even if it's a small amount of quantity. So swallowing, swallowing intentionally a pebble or a piece of paper or any item that is not used as a food source or, or medicine. Swallowing something edible equal to or bigger than a grain or gram of chick, a chickpea or something like this, which is stuck in between the teeth. However, if it's first brought, taken out of the mouth, so for example, if it's, if it's inside the mouth, if it's bigger than a chickpea, this will actually break. Now it's small. What's happened is that sometimes you get meat and other things stuck in between your teeth. So what happened is that, I, I, I do excuse the fact that it might, it might seem it's disgusting, but some of us have this habit, is that what happened is that they see the, 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 it's stuck, the meat is stuck in the mouth, they try to push the tongue, or they get the toothpick, they get the thing out, they say it's small, and they re-swallow it. If they re-swallow it, they'll break the fast. And now, <laughs> I know some of you are laughing, but it, people do do it. That's why the ruling is there. People do do it. So if you re-swallow it, uh, it will break the fast. Putting oil into the ear. So if a person needs some treatment, but they put oil into the ear, that will break the fast. Inhaling snuff into the nostril, that will also break the fast, but it doesn't require kafara. Swallowing the blood from other than the... Uh, swallowing the blood, and that's the blood which if you, if you were to spit and it was mixed with saliva, if, this, if the blood was greater than the saliva, and if you swallow that, that will also break the fast. To eat and drink, forgetting one is fasting, and thereafter thinking that the fast is broken. So, for example, I've eaten and drank, and go, oh, oh, I was fasting. Jolo, and I carry on. That will break the fast. You should, you should, when you realize you, uh, you, forgotfully, you forgot that you're fasting, and you ate, alhamdulillah, that's the reason why Allah Sondha, Allah Sondha fed you. The moment you come to realization, stop. And even if it's, uh, there's a look in your mouth, you're still biting, you've not swallowed, spit that out. That's it, you're still fine, inshallah. To eat, drink after Subha Sadiq, or to break the fast before sunset due to a cloudy day or a faulty watch. So here, oh no, is it time yet? Oh no, my watch is stopped, oh, it's not, it's not matching. And you know, here, your, your clock on your wall says it's time for the fast to open, but the azan's not coming from the mosque. What is happening? And you're panicking, what is happening? So you say, we'll still eat it. And then two seconds later, you hear the azan. And then you find out there's a difference between your time and their time. So basically is that, faulty watch, faulty timing, cloudy day, all of these things. If it's accidental, then you'll have to unfortunately break your fast. Uh, and if it's from yourself, obviously break the fast, but no kafara is actually uh, required. Inhaling medicine into the nostril, this will break the fast as well. These are just some of them, you've got more as well. Something which is a bit more delicate, you need to pay attention. I do apologize, but this is also in your books as well about the private past, engaging in sexual intercourse. Uh, if a husband and wife, they think they still, it's not fajr time yet, and they still carried on, then uh, and the fajr, fajr has actually entered, then this will actually break their fast. Engaging in, uh, in intercourse forgetful, they're after thinking the fast is broken, then deliberately having that again, this will actually break the fast. Entering uh, uh, the other part, the other hole, 
is also it's bilkul haram, but actually doing it is also break the fast. Entering something dry into the anus and then completely disobeying the body, this will also break the fast. So you can read this at your own leisure and actually get yourself uh, acquainted with those masalas. Body in general is touching, the, now here is a touching that causes one to ejaculate, which includes uh, masturbation, is that this will also break the fast uh, if ejaculation actually occurs as well. Applying medicine to open wound, uh, which uh, to the head, uh, which will reach the brain, or to the abdominal, which will reach the stomach or the intestine, this will actually break the fast as well. So those were acts that will break the fast, but no kufara is required. But these are now actions that will break the fast, but kufara is also required. Why are they? That's quite straightforward. Eating and drinking something that humans would normally consume, and this consumption nourishes, medicates, or pleases the body in some way without a valid reason. So here is that it nourishes it, it medicates or medicines, and pleases. So now we can add the category of narcotics here. It's like from, let's say, any steroids or drugs or whatever, it can also be part of that category as well. The body in some way without a valid reason. Without a valid reason. So there could be reason. Now we will talk about this, for example, in inhalers and so forth. What will happen? We'll talk about this later, but this is something that you need to know is that, that anything that you eat and drink knowingly, deliberately and knowingly, that without valid reason, it will actually break your fast. Actual intercourse, not masturbation, which only breaks the fast, but does, it needs to be repeated after Ramadan. Masturbation only requires you to make it up. There's no kafara for it. Whereas if you actually have intercourse knowingly, Front or rear, regardless if ejaculated or not, you'll have to give kafara. Swallowing the saliva of one's spouse, saliva of one's spouse, if there was intimacy and they were kissing, then swallowing the saliva of somebody else, one's spouse, and this will also require kafara. What is expiation? The expiation is to fast 60 consecutive days. That's the kafara, the, basically your penalty is that you fast for 60 consecutive days in the year without interruption. So it has to be consensual, musalsal, continuous, without any delay, without any inter interrupts. One must choose a time where one can fast these 60 days without interruption, like Eid will interrupt it. You're not allowed to fast on Eid, the two E's, and the days of Yom Tashriq. You're not allowed to fast in them days. So you have to avoid those days so that it's musalsal, it's 60 consecutive days. You figure out when that will be, and you fast those days. Now for sisters, for example, they, they have a menstruation, a hate. What do they do? For them is that they continue, they try and find those, uh, obviously miss, uh, without uh, adding the days of Eid and Ayyum uh, al those five days. After that, if they, for example, fast and then they come into menstruation, then they stop, and then as soon as the menstruation finishes, they start the fast again. That would be continuity for the sisters. Now, if at any point the sisters is that they, when the menstruation has actually stopped, they take a break, they need to restart again. The 60 days of consecutiveness would not have actually reached. And the same ruling applies for sisters who are in uh, nifas as well, postnatal bleeding. If one is genuinely unable to fast 60 consecutive days with reasonable surety, then what else can they do? This is what they can do. And this is not from, oh, yeah, no. the person is, for example, is really, really unwell, severely, maybe on his deathbed, maybe they're actually got other reasons, et cetera, et cetera, who knows. They are really, really unwell physically and they cannot do it or whatever for, to fast for 60 consecutive days. What do they do? They feed the same 60 poor people two meals. They find 60 poor people and they provide two meals for them. Feed one person, one poor person to his field for two meals for 60 days. This is what you can do. You can feed one poor person to his field for two meals for, uh, for, for 60 days. Give 60 people half a size is about 4.5 pounds of wheat or similar food grains or monetary value. Give 60 poor people nine pounds of dates or similar or, uh, uh, number of grains or is monetary value and give one poor person uh, something which it says here, which I, I'm unfortunate there's an error there. See, or the other thing is referring to one or the other. Either give this, the, 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 uh, the 4.5 uh, side of wheat, or you can give the dates as well. 
uh, if you want to do that. I think that's what I was referring to. What are the acts that do not break the fast? So we've talked about acts that break the fast. We've talked about the near intention. We've talked about conditions. What are the things that doesn't break the fast? Well, through the mouth and throat, eating, drinking something forgetfully, eating what is between the teeth if it's less than the size of chickpea, tasting the left out trace of medicine inside the mouth or throat, chewing on a sesame seed without swallowing it if it does not taste, uh, and if the taste does not reach the throat, dust or smoke entering one's throat without one's doing, uh, a mosquito or fly or neither object entering one's mouth without one's doing, so it can happen in summer period, there's a lot of brushes and trees, you're walking past, something can come in, it can happen, the, but that won't break it. Swallowing the wetness of the remains of washing in one's mouth of wudu and ghusl, so for example, if you swallow it, the wetness, for, what, you rinse your mouth and you feel the wetness of the water, that won't actually break it, okay? So, uh, teardrops entering the mouth with, uh, with one's saliva, Again, read to your field. We haven't got much time. We have to quickly go to the other parts. So these are things using miswak. You will not actually break the fast and so forth. From the prior parts, performing intercourse forgetfully, this will not break. The state of major ritual impurity. That this is something for the brothers to hear. They asked a lot of these questions. That if you're in a major ritual impurity, is your fast broken? No, it's not broken. If you have a wet dream or anything like this happens, you woke up. No, uh, your fast is still valid. You just do ghusl and that'll be fine. Ejaculation caused by looking or anything like, uh, like this, uh, then also you will not break the fast. Entering the, the, into the private parts, etc., etc. you can read this for yourself. Um, this will actually not break the fast. Performing stranger with water, providing the wetness does not reach the distance of mehkana. Uh, uh, basically, this is where the point where it enters completely, and you cannot see the point uh, of the finger or the point of place. Um, Mucus descended from the nose. I know you might be thinking it's stupid, but if, if a lot of people think this, so that's why it's written there, it doesn't break the fast. Sniff enough mucus, so for example, you've got a, a snotty nose, or you've, you've got a bad sore throat, or you've got a cold, or, or whatever, and the mucus develops, and you can't cough it out, so you swallow it, that will not break the fast. Inhaling smoke, perfume, or incense without your ones doing, smelling odors, these will not break the fast. Applying to the eyes, applying shur, uh, surma into the eyes, this will not break the fast. Uh, dripping eye drops in our contact, putting contact lenses will not actually break the fast. Wearing contact lenses, etc., they will not break the fast. Um, ears entering water, uh, water into the ear will not break the fast. It's oil they have to be worrying about. Uh, the body generally, if you put, a lot of people have this, this uh, misconception that if you put cream and all these other things in your face, this will break the fast. No, it doesn't. You don't have to look dead and you don't have to look morbid. You can actually look quite refreshing if you put some cream on, some conditioning on your face, whatever. So what we try to do, we make our lips look so dry, we make our face look as if it's dead, we make it look as if we're t completely dying. And so that when the other people see this, they think, oh, there's something wrong with this person here. Yeah, let's have some sympathy for him. No, look fresh, look energetic, alhamdulillah, yes, you can do all this. So and don't also kill other person. If you, ask, if you have an odor, do put some body odor. But if you've if you got deodorant or sprays, do use that. Don't let other people suffer from your consequences. Okay, it's not very nice if you have to go to sit next to the person and they're perspiring very violently. So you're allowed to use deodorants, you're allowed to use the sprays, do do that. Uh, blood clipping, this will also not actually break the fast. The mind, so remember, the mind intending to break one's fast, but not actually doing it. So if you think, I want to break the fast, uh, let me eat this, let me eat that, but you've not done it, it will not break the fast. So sinful thoughts will not actually break the fast. The spiritual fast, yeah, it might be broken, but the outward, the skin, the shell, that won't be broken, and that's why you need to be aware of that. Can I be affectionate with the spice while fasting? And if you're, I'm going to quickly read through this, uh, and then we'll come to an end. There are different reasons related to the question in various ways. Physical contact that does not break the fast. So passionate kissing, non-passionate kissing and hugs in which uh, one is free from swallowing the saliva of one's spouse and free from fear of falling to sexual intercourse and ejaculation, you can do that. So just a peck on the cheek, a little kisses, which does not allow that you, you'll actually be, uh, the, 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 the wife's saliva will actually go into yours or vice versa. That's perfectly fine, and it's non-passionate. Non-passionate touching, so holding hands, hugs, 
This can be done before you go home. If you, if you add this to hug your wife or kiss your wife on the head, whatever, you can do all that whilst you're fasting as well. There's no harm in that. Looking at one's spouse, so don't make it look as if... So what happens is that we go to the extreme. We've not got like, nowhere near our wife, so she, she's nothing there. So you don't look at her, you don't come near her. This is not what you're not supposed to do, okay? And the sisters, you shouldn't also look so morbid as well, that the husband literally does not want to go near you, doesn't want to look at you. Make yourself a little bit more presentable as well. Okay, physical contact that does not break the fast, but is pro uh, prohibited to dislike and sinful. So it doesn't break the fast, but it's very disliked, okay? Kissing with the desire, which one feels very formal into intercourse and ejaculation. Touching with the desire, which one feels will cause into going to the extreme. And anything sexual that one feels will lead to intercourse and emittance of ejaculation of semen, etc., etc. This will be uh, severely disliked, so you avoid it. So precaution is there. If the passion is there, don't go near. If there's no passion, alhamdulillah, that's fine. Physical contact that breaks up and requires, that breaks up fast and requires makeup only, that's ejaculation from masturbation and kissing and touching that causes ejaculation. And the others we've already explained, you need to do a kafara as well as makeup, deliberate kissing of one saliva and then have an intimacy and uh, session in the course that leads to that. Um, I'm nearly up, I think, but just quickly just refer to what is it, the kaf. Uh, in Ramadan, we sit, in the last 10 days, we sit the kaf. It, the kaf literally means enter the masjid or a secluded period, place, remain there for worship with intention of connecting Allah SWT, worship Allah SWT. There must be, be one where there's five daily prayers going as well as the Jumu'ah. Performing at the kaf in the last 10 days, the nights of Ramadan is strongly emphasized in a communal sunnah. It is blameworthy, and this is something which is important, is that it's blameworthy upon the community of, uh, that if, the whole, if nobody actually performs the kath in that area. This is a, for the, uh, this is sunnah mu'aqqada kifaya. So this is an emphatic sunnah which, we, which needs to be actually addressed and one actually do. If nobody's doing, somebody should do, otherwise the whole area will be actually sinful of neglecting this very important sunnah. There is one sunnah, you know sunnah is those acts that the Prophet did, sometimes did and sometimes they actually didn't do. One sunnah is, this is such a sunnah that the Prophet never actually refrained from. They always did. Always, month of Ramadan, they came, they did it the kaf. They always did. So don't deprive yourself of that blessed habit. And nowadays, if you tell people the kaf, they, they get a fright. Oh my God, what do I do? It the kaf. I got, then you see the excuse. Brother comes and says, no brother, I've got a job. I've got this. My family needs me. And all the list is going on. But this is just 10 days in the year. If 10 days in a year, if you can't, in, one, in some part of your life, if you can't actually manage to separate intentionally, voluntarily, then the one day will come when Allah Santa will deliberately, intentionally, will actually take you without your intention, He'll take you away and separate you from your family. Then what? So learn to go before you're taken. So can women perform? The, yes, they can perform, they can perform at the calf as well. Women's at the calf is best performed in prayer area in a house secluded room, one room or her bedroom where she prays. She can use that as her secluded area and she can do her baba, eba, that's there as well. Same rules as the mu'takif, she shouldn't actually do it, she should apply on herself as a, a person who's sitting at the calf in the masjid as well. So we end it here. All of these rulings, honestly, to, there's a lot of things I've missed out. It's in the pamphlet, it's in the booklet. Any question you have, you can ask. But inshallah, is you've gone through the inner aspect, now you've gone through the outward level. I hope now, both inward and outwardly, you have a perfected fast. So the shell was there to protect the spirit. The spirit, which is the kernel of your fast, which I actually went through, that was there to actually protect. That was there, that's the actual fast. The shell is there to always protect the inner, and that's why you need to know the outer ruling so that your fast calf can safeguard it in terms of point of sharia. Jazakum Allah khair, subhanakallah, bihamdik, ashadu la ilanda astaghfiratu ba ilaik.